Hi, everyone. Eric Prince here. Today, I'm joined by Stephen Hicks, a great philosopher and someone who I had a very good discussion with back in the summer of 2020. So I guess we'll be checking in a little bit on how things have progressed in the time since, and especially uh, a focus on the recent trucker protests in Canada and insofar as that might provide a lens through which we might grasp some of the concepts of the day. Uh, so Stephen, very good to see you again. Yeah, thanks, thanks Eric. Uh, yeah, pleasure to be back. Great. So what are some of the things that are jumping out to you as you look at the events in Ottawa and across Canada over the past couple of weeks? Where is your head at? Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that's a, that's a big question. Um, you know, I'm Canadian by birth and uh, have a joint citizenship now. And so the, the thing that immediately jumped out at me in the early stages of the, the protest was a, a kind of a, a finally, uh, because you know, as you know, Canadians have a stereotypical reputation, right? Largely deserved for, for being very nice people or for being uh, somewhat deferential uh, you know, you know, the joke is that we say sorry about you know, everything, Some even of my when favorite we're people are from Canada. I'm sorry. Some of my favorite people are from Canada. <laughs> that sweet, that sweet well, now you're going down a down another road. But yes, absolutely. Uh, and uh, uh, with respect to you know, two years going into the the pandemic, the Canadian citizenry was enormously deferential, you know, uh, giving wide latitude to the government. Uh, to, uh, to tell them what to do, to alleviate them from a certain measure of self-responsibility. And it always struck me that that was uh, you know, a, a weakness, as, you know, as, as awesome as Canada is as a culture, that element of the Canadian personality stereotypically conceived is, uh, is, uh, is a weakness. In other words, you might argue that Americans go a little bit too far the other way, of being you know, too outgoing and too brash and too in your face in, in many respects. And there's always a, you know, a contextual judgment that goes on there. So initially I was encouraged that when, uh, what struck me as clear government overreach and a clear lack of stepping up and asserting self-responsibility. You know, this is our lives, this is our health. We are adult human beings. We can take control of our, our situations and make uh, good decisions and, and work things out ourselves. And finally, some people were, were stepping up and, and, and making a protest. Uh, and we're not familiar with Canadians engaging in protests like that. You know, the, the French protest at the drop of a hat, another stereotype, lots of American protests that were going on. But who would have expected that you know, a, a cross country protest would initiate in Canada and that uh, Ottawa, <laughs> uh, 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 of all places, would be at the center of the world attention on, on exactly those, uh, those issues. So that was my initial reaction. How about yours? Well, yeah, I think that that's a great point, because I remember seeing a lot of these clips in Canada, particularly with churches and various religious events, where during the pandemic, I guess people were trying to attend services, and they were really not permitted to do so. And, um, you know, I guess in the United States, there was a lot of people who were fairly resistant to uh, some of the lockdown and the various COVID procedures. Uh, obviously, I'm not following Canadian politics, you know, hourly, but it seemed as though that they were much more going along with it. And I know Canada has a little bit of a reputation of being, as you were saying, maybe people being a little more, sometimes I'm like, why don't these people kind of raise a ruckus more? Um, so I don't know if it was just kind of things were bottled up and, you know, kind of this was the real, let's get it out. You know, we've been, this has been festering for a while. But uh, I think what's really struck me more than anything else is the degree of the reaction on the part of the Canadian government in recent days, and particularly when it came to freezing these bank accounts. And I think that that's where... Yeah. If you're someone like me and you're concerned, very concerned about the trajectory of how a lot of these things are going, uh, first you see a lot of this online censorship that's impacted a lot of people you and I know, it's impacted me, I think it's impacted a lot of people. And, but to get to a point where your, your assets, where your, not only your ability to make a living, but money you've already made is potentially mm -hmm 
coming into the crosshairs of the central government, to me, that's a pretty terrifying thing that happened. And yes. I would hate for this to be some sort of precedent setting event where if you participate in certain acts of speech or certain demonstrations against the government, you're going to not be entitled to your own money. And I'll just also say sort of the disconnect between when it happened on the other side in the summer of 2020 and a lot of major institutions and corporations were really on the side of the demonstrators when they had this kind of left of center objective. But now when people are protesting things that the powers that be want, the gloves are off. Yeah. And uh, from my uh, philosophical perspective and studying intellectual history and political history and so forth, uh, another thing that is striking exactly about the, the points you're raising as, as very good examples is how every generation we need to learn and relearn how thin the line can be in between having a basically liberal society and a basically authoritarian society. And so how, uh, how one protests uh, under a liberal regime, and this applies both to the protesters and to the government versus how protests go uh, in authoritarian societies is a very important bellwether. And I think it is fair to say that obviously Canada is a, you know, a glorious country with a long liberal democratic Republican tra history, but many of those institutions have been hollowed out over the course of the last generation or two generations, uh, and a similar thing is happening in the United States. And it is precisely when an emergency arises or some sort of thing that uh, is, is on a trajectory to becoming an emergency that you find out how robust those core institutions are and how far they've been, uh, they've been hollowed out. So in the case of a, 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 a culture and a polity that is committed to liberalism, uh, there should be vast deference granted to protesters. Protesters should be free, unencumbered, even welcomed by the politicians who are being protested. Uh, it's, a, it's another way of having one's voice heard. And typically there's a standard question, how bad does the issue need to be before one gathers a protest instead of going through right ordinary, ordinary channels. So when we've had you know, two years of uh, uh, of, of major problems, just the, the whole pandemic and its response. It's understandable that people are being fed up. They're not uh, clear that their voices are being heard, particularly in the case of Canada uh, with its uh, geographical spread outness. Uh, there's a chronic problem of people in the West not feeling that they're being heard by the powers that be that are located in the East. Uh, and so for them to, uh, to, to step up and say, we need to make clear, sure that our voices are heard on these very important issues, like who's responsible for our health? Are we in a position to make a living and provide for our families or not? It doesn't get more important than that. And the government should be extraordinarily deferential, even welcoming of that sort of protest. Now, at the same time, there is a legitimate issue on the other side. What is the range of legitimate actions that protesters can engage in? Uh, and so we start to say things like, well, we are doing some blockading right? and we are honking our horns very loudly and disturbing the peace. And clearly those are uh, actions that cross a line in normal circumstances. So there's a judgment call about whether they are staying within the line or crossing the line or not. But that said, the deference should be in a liberal society to giving the protesters the widest possible latitude. And uh, when we start to find the kinds of measures that you were alluding to being resorted to very quickly, we're going to right, start freezing people's bank accounts. We're not going to go through due process. Uh, that is that's a standard tool in the authoritarian's toolkit. When you say we're going to call in child services and we are going to go after your kids and we're going to threaten to take your kids away, right? Uh, that is a, <laughs> something only in clear cases of child abuse, right? After investigation, if very quickly you are pulling that uh, gun out, that's a sign of a certain kind of uh, uh, anti-liberal dispiriting uh, 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 political context that we've arrived at. And I think it's a little, jarring for a lot of people when 
these actions are being carried out by a party in power that calls itself liberal. Well, yes, that's right. So, yeah, we do have uh, 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 and, and this issue of definitions, you know, what's a liberal, what's an authoritarian, right? What's a protest? And then all of the names that get slung around, you know, who's a terrorist, who's a racist. Uh, so we do know that a lot of these terms are abused, right, much more than they are used. And once again, we find here we are in something approaching an emergency, uh, people's cognitive habits and their linguistic habits uh, come to have incredible importance. So if in a situation where, you know, tempers are high, who starts name calling very quickly? Uh, the, the, uh, and particularly if it's a person in a position of power who's engaging in name calling and using language in a slippery fashion, that's another sign of, uh, of a hollowing out that's going on. So, yes, uh, but the Canadian liberals have always been a, a, a middle of the road party. They are uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, social democrats in their, in their core. And so to say that in some sense they are principled in a principled way committed to liberalism or any sort of classical liberalism has become a, a misnomer. 50 or 60 years ago, that's true, but the party has drifted significantly toward the center and, and to the left of center. So it's a bit of a misnomer. It does mean that on many, uh, many policy issues, they are, they are anti-liberal. So for people who aren't as familiar with the inner workings of Canadian politics and government affairs over the past half century or quarter century, you alluded earlier to this hollowing out of precedent or of institutions. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Well, sure. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, if we say, for example, um, the Canadian Charter of Rights, right, which is uh, you know analogous to the American Bill of Rights and, uh, and its constitutional principles. And uh, rights is a heavy duty concept in political philosophy. Uh, rights are supposed to be uh, 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 in inalienable. Uh, they are not something that are privileges granted by government. Rather, they are uh, prerogatives that one has and that the government should be recognizing. The job of the government is not to give you privileges and give you permissions and give you licenses and so on. Rather, you have certain rights to your life, liberty, property, uh, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and so on, right? No matter what. And so what uh, has happened uh, as a matter of political philosophy, and this has spilled out then into political practice, is rights language comes to be more slippery. Uh, and rights then do start to see, well, there's this exception, there's that exception. And so we don't really have a concept of rights significantly uh, operationalized in the political context. And so it's, it does come to be a matter of then saying, yes, we list all of these things and they sound nice as ideals, but at a certain point they come to be words on a piece of paper, not actually followed in practice. So that is a, is a, is a hollowing out. We have a more general uh, issue of uh, the, this issue of trust in institutions. Uh, and there's been a lot of talk about trust and the prime minister and various members of the cabinet and commentators on both sides saying, you know, trust or don't trust and who trusts and so on. But we do know that uh, over the course of the last half century, uh, the track record of politicians being untrustworthy uh, has become increasingly so. And it's not even so much that, you know, we, we say, yeah, politicians lie and uh, that, that's kind of a shame. And we're going to be vigilant with respect to politicians and increase our accountability and hold them to their election promises and so on. Instead, what is happening is politicians lie comes to be not the, the, the exception that we make jokes about, but the, ex the expected practice. And so that then means uh, if you have two generations of people expecting politicians to lie, then when a serious situation comes up and we are looking to the politicians for leadership, then we are in a terrible situation because we don't know whether to, to, to trust the politicians or not. And then the politicians pretend to be offended when people don't just automatically give them the trust that they want. And then when they're not given that cultural trust, then they start to say, well, 
I need to do certain things. And then they are more in a position to start resorting to authoritarian measures. So we always know that politicians lie, but there is a, a kind of a normal, <laughs> if I can use that word, level of political lying that should be accepted in a democratic republic that has been hollowed out. And now the expectation more is that politicians are liars, and that's a terrible situation to be in. Well, just as many students or commentators on financial markets will emphasize that the entire system presupposes or runs on trust, I think there's yes. a similar analog going on with a political system. And when you have, for example, the United States, um, people talk about we need to solve this fact that so many people sit out of elections with mandatory voting, for instance, and you say, well, no, it's, it's telling you something that people don't want to participate in the democracy or and such, or just when you get to the point where that level of trust is, is lost, I think it's hard to have that input from the people as a, as a check on the government, as a participant in the relationship between the governed and the, and the right. subjects, uh, the government and the governed, because a lot of people are just not buying into the basic tenets of the system. Exactly right. No, that's exactly right. And the way this has to work in a democratic republic is that the politicians not only need to police themselves, but the parties need to police themselves. So what we know happens is you know, a politician lies, a politician gets caught in some sort of scandal, you know, sleeping with the wrong spouse or whatever it is. And rather than the healthy thing saying, you know, we don't want you to be a part of our political party because we don't trust you anymore. We stand for certain principles. We police our own. Rather, what we find is the standard thing is the cover up. And it becomes a tribal thing where the parties gather around someone they know is a rotten apple or a bad apple and try to protect that person. And then, of course, it does come out after a certain amount of time, but that's a further hollowing out. So what we need to get back to is citizens uh, expecting more of the politicians, not saying, oh, political lying is business as usual, but also reform within the parties. If you are going to be a, a political party in a democratic republic, that means a certain set of commitments to ideals, and you need to take your ideals seriously. We're losing some of that. I think that's a great concrete suggestion. It makes me think that not long ago, uh, a few months back, there was a, a Senate candidate here where I live in Pennsylvania, Sean Parnell, and it became clear that he uh, had some very credible allegations of uh, domestic abuse against his wife that came out, and then he kind of withdrew from consideration for the Senate campaign. So maybe that's one possible example. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think that that's a, that is a healthy thing. Um, obviously, citizens need to vet their politicians better, but uh, also the parties need to vet their candidates better. And uh, you know, That's it's, great point. It's, it's it's a it's a hard lesson, but you know, truth and justice are not just words. And even in the temptation of short run pol politicking, uh, that tribal instinct of covering things up, you, you have to resist that temptation. <laughs> so. This is, uh, I'm glad you brought that up, A, the point about the parties policing themselves. And historically, at least in the American context, the parties played a major role in determining who the candidates would be. And maybe yeah. that's become a little less so in the primary system, but they certainly still have the power to exercise a lot of um, leverage based on campaign finance, based on endorsements, which I think is, is very important. Um, so as some people who follow my work recently uh, might know on Monday, I recorded an, a podcast episode with Alex Zubatov, who writes at MW and Tablet and a few other outlets. And he's an immigrant from the Soviet Union. And the subject of the, the, the conversation was initially an essay he wrote, uh, Soviet Immigrant Reminds Americans What He'd Forgotten. And he was recounting a recent conversation he had had with his parents who were talking about kind of what, you know, what's going on in the United States. And they said that what most surprised them is that in Russia, people didn't really believe the propaganda very much, at least by the time of the 1970s. Mm. And the point that he brought up was he, he and his parents were so surprised that in the United States, so many educated, professional people, people on a lot of metrics who are pretty bright and functional, are believe so many things that seem to be just basically sloganeering and basically mm. 
just kind of dressed up party orthodoxy presented as absolute fact. And he was interested in kind of the demographics of who believes this stuff. And I don't know if this is something yeah. you know about, Stephen. No, absolutely. There is, um, in a way, it's, it's, it's admirable because there's a kind of benevolence and a naivete, you know, as much as we're cynical and jaded about politics and, you know, we watch all the movies and so on, there still is a, uh, a healthy respect for one's fellow citizens, you know, a level of, of trust and respect that people are mostly about doing the right thing. And that does extend to the, to the political system. Uh, and that can come out in a certain form of naivete. So, the idea that you know, we chose these uh, politicians to represent us, they really are committed to truth, justice in the Canadian way, uh, and we're going to give them the benefit of the, of the doubt. Uh, and so that happening, people do uh, more often than not turn off their, their critical thinking, and they're more willing to defer and, and, and to adopt. Part of it's a matter of a division of labor. Uh, the politicians are going to look after certain things while I get on with the rest of my life. I don't want I to think about, about certain things. Sorry? That's something I talk about all the time. Yes, that's right. Rather than seeing uh, you know, democratic republicanism as a do-it-yourself process, you need to be actively involved right all the way through. Uh, and it's not just a cognitive sloppiness or, or cognitive laziness, but I think there is that, that naivete. And I think uh, one of the, the lessons of political history is how every generation does need to relearn that lesson about power, right? It's, it's not that power necessarily corrupts, but there always is in some generation or in each generation, some politicians who will corrupt the power, who really, uh, they, they do not have a commitment to truth, justice in the Canadian way. They just want to aggrandize their position. Right. Or they're not really uh, conceptually committed to democratic liberalism in any deep way. They're much more opportunistic. And so they are more likely to use the, uh, the, the weapons of government or the tools of government much too quickly and much, new, uh, much too, much too pr promiscuously. And so this is a, it, it's a lesson. That, and I think this is a, a useful thing. And one of the beautiful things about the protests and as much as I was uh, uh, disgusted by some elements of the protests in America over the last two years, nonetheless, and they always are good learning lessons for us to have these national conversations about power. When we see citizens acting badly, when we see politicians acting badly, we have millions of us having discussions about what was right about that, what was wrong about that, what is the lesson, and we become a little more educated about it. So in this case here, uh, hopefully, uh, and I know it is happening, so it's, it's more than just hopefully, we do have what strikes me as clear government overreach. Yes, the truckers, there are some things we can blame about them. But what we have then is a clear example of government is about compulsion. It is about the police and the military using force to shut certain things down. That is an awesome power in the sense of awe-striking power. And for the most part, we're, we, we, we take it for granted that the government hasn't and is going to use it well. So what we need to do then is think exactly about what are the issues that we are going to go to the mat for? Right? At what point are we willing to say, yeah, this is a law, this is a principle, this is an exception that we are willing to say, the police can point a gun in someone's face over this matter. That power needs to be <laughs> vigilously thought about every single generation. So this is, this is our moment. And I think you hinted at it earlier, but it's a crucial point and kind of this whole idea of crisis and Leviathan, but the idea of an emergency or some situation that is deemed kind of beyond the pale. And then all of a sudden you see all this force and all this potential for maybe misuse that's been coalescing for years and it all sort of becomes Unleash yeah. other people back to your term about sort of uh, point about sort of concept creeps of terms. A lot of people, for instance, were concerned that after the events of January 6th, that there was going to be this effort to, and some it was even called for openly by certain members of Congress to define a whole lot of people as quote unquote terrorists, not just right. the people who are there, but people who, you know, maybe express certain opinions on, on social media. And um, I think that's a really important point. Um, and I just say one thing. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, 
no, no, follow up. That's fine. Yeah, you and have a good role there. Say that is a concern for me because you made a great point, and I agree with you that these occasions are opportunities to think about government, think about the role of protests, think about the issues at stake. But one of the concerns that comes up these days is with the degree to which so much of our discourse happens online, and given that a lot of these companies put their finger on the scale, sometimes it's hard to have these open discussions because Twitter, Facebook, a lot of these places where they might ordinarily happen are kind of aligned in many ways with the various mm. government groups and it's not maybe the free marketplace of ideas that you know you and I can have in a private conversation or people could have around a table when so much of this is done virtually and these companies are not always on the side of free expression yeah well i i am concerned about that yeah the uh, the media issues and the social media platforms but i think i'm a lot less concerned about it than uh, many other 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 people are I mean, part of this then is my my living historical memory. So if we go back to you know uh, just you know the 1970s and we were to say how many opportunities do Canadians and Americans have for significant conversations about national events? How many platforms are there? And you're know, there. You're talking about some radio stations and three national networks. And there's actually a, a, a large body of regulations in place that make it very difficult for new radio stations, new television stations to come on online and so forth. So I, I want to say that we are hugely better off now in terms of the number of media platforms than we were, say, in the, 19, the 1980s. So we have uh, you know, burgeoning internet radio. We do have all of the major platforms. Newspapers are, 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 are doing, doing pretty well. We don't just have uh, the three major news networks. Instead, we've got dozens of major uh, news networks. We have access to all of the international news networks and so on. So uh, it, it, it's out there. And uh, uh, to the extent that people are willing to put in their time, and do the kinds of things that they know they need to do, check multiple sources before making up their own minds. Uh, and still, we are in a position, uh, even if you have your objections to Twitter and objections to Facebook and their, their uh, sometimes heavy handed algorithms and so on, you still are in a position, and it happens every day, to form various sorts of group groups and, and private uh, conversations. Right, and, you and I were on uh, ThinkSpot. Yeah, and, and we're doing this right now at ThinkSpot. Right? And so all of this is happening. We still know it's the early days of social media. Some of the companies are going to be more uh, heavy handed, but that will spur a market correction. And there's lots of entrepreneurial effort going on in the direction of creating new platforms that will uh, correct the errors of, of this generation, social media platforms and so on. So yes, there, there are problems there, and in the short term, certain kinds of uh, censoring, censoring is not quite the, the right word, but something close to that is going on, but I'm not too worried about it. Well, we are seeing new platforms come into existence. For instance, I have a show now on, on Colin, which kind of David Sachs from PayPal has gone all in on creating this you know, pro-free speech podcasting network, so they are sort of coming to existence. So another question I want to ask you on, on cannabis. So I'm, we're seeing in the polls that it seems like a lot of Canadians think that maybe Trudeau has overreached. Do you think that that will hold? Or are people going to kind of forget about that and go back to life as it is? Because we know that in some respects in politics that memories are short. And then in other cases, yeah. our events, for instance, Joe Biden's approval ratings have never recovered from Afghanistan. So it seems as though there are yeah. certain events that the public has a longer memory on and, and certain that others that yeah. was this something that Canadians are going to remember? Is this a watershed moment or is this after six weeks back to business as usual? Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of duck that question. I, mean, I think uh, crystal ball gazing yeah. is, is hard enough inside my areas of expertise. And while I do follow uh, Canadian news, uh, and you know, more especially in the past uh, year or two, uh, I think that's an almost impossible question, question to ask. So I think, yes, uh, Trudeau will suffer from, from this. I think the liberals will suffer. Uh, I think there's a normal back and forth between the liberals and the conservatives in Canadian politics anyway. And the liberals have had their run for a while. So the natural swing might just be to go to, to, uh, to the conservatives in the, in the next election. Uh, or it, of course, it could just be that this is his, uh, his Waterloo. 
that he overreached and Canadians won't forgive and, and forget. But uh, predicting that level of detail in the Canadian political psyche six months out or, or, or a year and a half out when the next election comes up, I'm not, uh, I'm not gonna go there. Yeah, fair enough. Um, so as far as, so we talked about it a little bit about this um, kind of historically speaking, this sort of fine line between authoritarianism and a basic sort of liberal democracy or, or mm -hmm. liberal system. Um, are there some other examples that come to mind for you based on your own kind of studies of, of intellectual history and, and philosophy? Are there certain other um, places where this is played out that you think are particularly informative? Uh, well, I think all of <laughs> all of political history, uh, that's a, that's an overstatement, but I've certainly all of modern political history is, uh, you know, having gotten rid of feudalism, essentially, in the in the 1700s and, and so on, starting in Western Europe and then being transplanted to to uh, all of the new countries across the pond. The, uh, the big question has been, what are we going to replace feudalism with? And so at that point, the, the lines between a kind of liberalism and a vertical uh, hierarchical uh, uh, authoritarianism, if we can say that monarchies and aristocracies are forms of authoritarianism, uh, then the line between liberty and authority was very clear. What has become less clear, uh, although the 20th century was another big uh, teaching example, was the new forms of authoritarianism that came along. And these were the experiments with more authoritarian forms of socialism. So the impetus of liberalism in the modern world was to focus on the individual and to grant uh, respect for a wide range of individual freedoms. But liberty is the most important point. And equality is a, is, a, is a qualifier of the liberty, that everybody has equal liberties versus those who took the failure of hierarchical structures to mean that what we need to do is engage in a kind of leveling, that everyone should have in a very robust way, equal status, not just politically, but also economically, religiously, family structure, and so on. So we have this uh, equality in that form juxtaposed to liberty. And in the 1800s, it wasn't always clear about the relationship between equality and liberty. But then we know in the 20th century, those who were robustly about equality uh, conjoined that with a very authoritarian political instantiation of it. And so we had the egalitarian socialisms of the nationalist sort, of the fascist sort, of the internationalist sort. And so a big part of the, uh, the 20th century political history is uh, reaffirming liberalism with its uh, you know, free markets, with its democratic Republican politics, making sure that that's going to prevail against the new forms of authoritarianism. So I think what we are getting now into the 20th century are uh, new skirmishes. You know, pretty much everybody recognizes now that some sort of free market economy has to be in place. However much you think it needs to be undergirded by certain sorts of regulations or overseen by certain sorts of regulations, everybody in the broadest sense is leaning toward market liberalism. For the most part, we are respectful of religious liberalism. Uh, we've gotten rid of military drafts. And we, we say that when, we're, when we are fighting people, we should have people who actually believe in the military, believe in the cause. That's a great like example. Signing up for, for, for yeah. that. Right, and all of the sexual liberalism and so forth. You know, people should be free in their sexual lives to be who they want. And so we've gotten rid of a lot of that. But we are still struggling with other dimensions where we are tempted to say liberalism isn't going to work. And so the authoritarianism comes out on those particular on those particular issues. So health matters is one. You know, clearly, we were not ready psychologically to deal with another pandemic. So for the most part, in many countries, the authoritarians got there first, <laughs> and the, the liberals were were fighting a rear guard rear guard action uh, on environmental issues. So we have another set of issues there on uh, our, our continuing worries about racism and sexism and so on. Do we need authoritarian speech codes and quotas and so forth? Or can we handle this uh, as civil liberals? 
Well, when we talk about climate, that seems to be an interesting case study of sorts. For instance, you were just talking about when it comes to censorship, that the solution is more companies can form and, you know, the market will sort of take care of it. And I guess there's two sort of tied to this, two sort of big camps in um, solutions to climate issues. There's sort of a camp that says, perhaps aligning with the authoritarian, let's impose restriction X, let's impose restriction Y. And then there's a whole set of people like Tom Hyde who writes at MW and basically says, if we continue to pursue economic growth, we'll get cleaner and cleaner energy. And some of these problems will sort of be solved along the way by right. nations come along. Right. No, no, that, that's exactly right. So as, you know, as long as I, I'm not expert in this area, but I do yeah. teach a, Yeah, no, I do teach a unit on uh, environmental ethics in most years in my, my course. And, and it's very clear that it's an authoritarian at, at the political level. It's an authoritarianism versus a versus a, a liberalism. Yeah. yeah and so once yeah, it's such a great example. Yeah, no, that, no, that that's exactly right. So uh, I remember actually the first year that I, that I taught that course. Uh, we used in the course Al Gore's Earth in the Balance, and it was, you know, it was very clear not only that, you know, he bought into everything as a disaster, but everything is a disaster of epic proportions, and the only thing that can save us is uh, uh, granting unprecedented powers to the federal government to change basically everything about the economy. Exactly. So, yes, and now that's, uh, that's, oh gosh, pushing on 30 years ago now, so it's it's uh, it's exactly that same debate. But again, it, it, it's 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 interesting, and this is a, a perennial issue because freedom and having a free society does mean that people will be doing all sorts of things that are new, that are creative, that are innovative, uh, and it's not always clear to the when somebody is proposing something new and innovative and creative, and when we're changing our culture along many dimensions, that we are doing the right things. And in many cases, there will be failed liberal experiments. And so the chronic reaction then is going to be from the authoritarians to say, we should not be doing that sort of experiment in the first place because it is failing, or this experiment has led to some downsides and liberalism can't clean up its own mess. We need to now have some authoritarianism to fix the problem. But there seems to be sort of, and I, I recorded an episode uh, last week with uh, Dr. Clay Routledge. She talks a little bit about some of these concepts, but there seems to be an essential quality of optimism about this, the liberal project, so to speak, that through the process of, of discovery and exploration, we're going to kind of push things forward and a, kind of a sense of, of possibility. I know George Will talks about kind of this idea of welcoming world of yes. this flux of, and kind of contrasted from you know, this sort of steady state theory of, of politics, so to speak. But yes, this yeah. Constant flux and activity. And although it's messy, eventually we find a way towards better things because the better things kind of crowd out the bad things. Yeah. You know, no, I, and I think that it's, it's, it's tempting. Um, actually, I want to say something stronger than, than tempting. It's, it's, it's a reasonable position to say that not all of these things are, are, are driven by at the political ideology level, but that there are psychological predispositions that people have toward being, as you put it nicely, being welcoming to the world, right? And, and being open to the world and the idea of being entrepreneurial and trying new things. And yes, we're going to fail, but there's that benevolence and, and self-confidence that yes, we're going to fail, but we can figure out how to fix the messes that we've made. Uh, that psychology uh, being predictive of people's political ideology compared to a psychology that is much more risk averse, that we need to maintain a steady state because we see the world and ourselves as fragile, as vulnerable, and uh, any uh, kind of new experiment or we're just one failure away from everything blowing up. And so what we need to do is clamp down on things in our personal lives and not be risk averse. And, uh, and be intolerant or intolerant rather of people who want to try and do things, the eccentrics and so on, and to then on the basis of that psychological predisposition support an ideology that will check the people who are doing the liberal entrepreneurism. So yes, George Gilder is, is good on this. Virginia Postrel has written very well on this. Um, and uh, yeah, I know in the entrepreneurship literature, 
There's a great deal of discussion about whether there is an entrepreneurial psychological type, you know, the difference between the kind of person who says, yeah, I am going to take charge of my life. Yeah, I'm going to start some businesses. I'm probably going to fail a few times, but I'll figure out a way versus the person who wants the safe, steady job, someone to make the decisions for him or her and the guaranteed paycheck at the, at the end of the week. So if you cast it in kind of business culture terms uh, and isolate the psychological elements there, it's easy then to transpose those to the political landscape. Yeah, what's so interesting, this was perhaps the, my favorite part of my discussion with Clay is I was raising the potential distinction between being psychologically or personally optimistic or pessimistic and being kind of philosophically optimistic or pessimistic. I borrowed it a little bit from uh, Joshua Deanstag's book, uh, The Philosophy mm. on Pessimism. And I think there's some great examples. For example, John Stuart Mill, I guess, has this kind of great faith in human progress, but is pretty miserable on a day-to-day -day basis. And maybe someone like right. sure. Yakov has kind of a fallen uh, worldview, but as Harold Bloom says, he wrote very cheerfully throughout the day. And I think right. it's interesting yeah. how somebody could maybe, and I, I see this a little bit in, in myself, that you could have certain views about the world at large, but your own personal disposition could be a little disconnected from that on the day. No, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, we can't be reductionistic about it and then just say that your, person, I, your personal psychology dictates right, everything. Right. Yeah. There, there can be a, yeah, there can be a, a, a tendency. And uh, often when we talk about a person's psychology, uh, we are talking about, in many cases, their, their habits and their personality and their emotional set. And uh, in many cases, those can be uh, uh, largely formed in your childhood. And, uh, but at the same time, part of your psychology is your thinking brain. And it can be the case that you know, if you read pessimistic news right, or you are working in a particular domain where there really is a lot of bad stuff that's going on, yeah. right, your conscious rational self will be more pessimistic than your, your underlying, uh, underlying psychology. It is an interesting phenomenon. I, I come up in other conversations before, uh, just on the, the relationship between psychology personally and ideology. I am struck by the fact that uh, if you think of the current public uh, intellectual landscape, who are the most famous or well known public intellectuals currently of our generation? And then we have to cite, or the names I would cite are obviously Jordan Peterson. I think uh, everybody knows Jordan Peterson. He comes uh, to mind for a lot of people. I think he's maybe, right. maybe number one in terms of kind of sheer yeah. influence. He, Absolutely. You know, and also and the other names, just to, if I just let me finish this quick thought. Yeah. Um, but also then I would say, you know, Jonathan Haidt, uh, New York University, you know, another huge name on the landscape, and both of them deservedly so. And then also Steven Pinker. That's uh, literally the three I would have said. If you had said name okay. the three, that's okay, perfect. Okay, we are exactly on the same important. page on that. Now, here's the interesting three things. All three of those guys are psychologists. And what's interesting is if we were to ask that question maybe 50 years ago, who are the most famous public intellectuals, we might have said people like John Kenneth Galbraith or Milton Friedman and other people, all of whom were economists. So I think it is interesting about where we are culturally right now in terms of our debates on all of these issues that it seems to be psychologists who are stepping to the fore uh, most prominently with the things that we need to hear and discuss. So uh, now I don't know how far to go down that road, but that's a very interesting I observation. Interesting follow questions because that is a really interesting observation and yes. I've never thought about that before. And I think that is really an interesting observation. Why, why okay. do you think that is? Well, uh, yeah, I think <clears throat> I, I mean I would like as a philosopher for uh, the more philosophers to be <laughs> sure. occupying those stages. More journalists, but our, our profession is not doing so well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, I think the, that the, what the psychologists do is they split the difference between our professions very nicely. So the occupational hazard and actually the, the beauty of philosophy is that it operates at a very high level of abstraction and generality. Uh, and journalists operate on a very nitty gritty day to day level. But what then uh, what we're interested in is how do these high abstract theories of cognition and moral principles, how do we actually operationalize those in our personal lives? How and what implications do they have for the day to day 
uh, social operations that we engage in, in business, in our family lives, and in our, in our political discussions as well. And so at that level, uh, we're looking for a principled understanding, but it's not at a high level of abstraction, and it's not just day-to-day -day journalism. And I think the psychologists are the ones who are best positioned to speak at that level, and that's what we need. I wonder if it's also, and correct me if I'm wrong, it seems as though, at, you know, at mid-century, as you pointed out, you had your, it was the day of the economists, whether it's Keynes, whether it's obviously maybe Milton Friedman is a little later, but, you know, the first thing that I would think of is that was a time where there was need for a lot more kind of economic growth, a lot more wealth creation. And now it seems as though there has been so much wealth creation over the past X amount of time. And then we hear kind of these, this apparent paradox where a lot of people are wealthier than ever, have better li living standards than ever, especially in the West, but they're not as happy. And they're maybe a little yes. disconnected from community. And they're a little disconnected from the sort of things that had given people meaning historically, and that some would argue have come to the cost at some degree of this economic growth. And now yeah. we're in this period of people being kind of unmoored. And now they say, okay, Milton Friedman did his job. Now I got to fix, fix out what's, you know, between my two ears. Right. Now, I think that's, uh, that's a beautifully philosophical issue. So I think uh, more of us philosophers need to step up on this one. So in one sense, I think that is absolutely right, because uh, once you have achieved a society where there's a great deal of liberty, and that was the accomplishment of the enlightenment of the late 1700s and on into the, the 1800s, people are free, unbelievably so, extending or the, the, the freedoms across the board, uh, you know, obviously first to, to males who were in a position to fight for it, then to women freeing the slaves or increasing religious tolerance and so on. So that battle for liberty. And then in the 20th century, as you are mentioning, all of this incredible wealth production to the point where you know, basically our, you know, our problem is not you know, finding enough food, but having too much food. Right, right. Uh, and that, and having uh, not just an occasional uh, movie every other month or so, but being saturated with entertainment options. So, okay. I'm sorry. So at that point, you are free and you are rich. But what do you do with your freedom? What do you do with all of those riches? And that's not easy, and that's not automatic. And so now we are thinking about that, and we need to think about that. The way I like to think about this one is if we think about you know teenager angst and so on. You know, what do I want to be when I grow up? What kind of person can I be? Am I ready to take on this big world? That is a very 21st century problem. Teenagers in the 1800s and the 1600s didn't have that problem. <laughs> they were focusing on how am I going to survive? <laughs> how am I not going to be killed uh, for, for, uh, for, for being the wrong class or the wrong religion or, or whatever it is and so on? So, but that, that is a hard question. That, that is the meaning of life question. That's precisely what philosophy should be about. And I think the, the, the challenge that we face right now is that uh, in terms of education, formal education, we are not doing a good job at giving students the cognitive and the emotional skills to be able to take on that project. Instead, we're giving them a lot of freedom and we're giving them a lot of riches, but not the value framework within which to handle that well. So an example I, I, I would give, give of this is, and it's a bit of a stereotypical example, but there are lots of good studies on this. Is if you think of the trust fund babies as, as an example. Right, uh, so one example that comes to mind is, uh, you know, a, a, it was written by a woman, but she was talking about her husband who was one of 16 kids who Basically, when they were teenagers, an older relative who was extraordinarily wealthy died and left each of them a trust fund that they didn't have to work for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. So that then is to say at a very early age, what you've got is 16 young people and they're all rich and they're all free to do whatever they want with their lives. And the anecdote, this is still anecdotal, but what she points out is that 15 out of the 16 became drunks drug addicts, ne'er-do-wells, beach bums, and so forth. So they did not succeed, despite having all of that wealth and freedom, at putting together a meaningful life for themselves. She said her husband was the exception. He got through medical school and became a doctor and, 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 and was, living, was living a good life. So that, uh, that I think, is a, is a deep problem. So are you sympathetic to these, I know, just like 
you're probably um, not super enthusiastic to predict the future, probably also concerned about some of these sweeping labels we have of society. But what do you make of people who say that ours is the age of crisis of meaning? And I know you like past examples, we have, you know, the age of anxiety, but there does seem to be a sense that there is some sort of loss of meaning for a lot of people these days. And that is yeah. really something else I wanted to ask you about in our remaining time, which is sort of this rise of the national conservative movement, which is yeah. uh, the, the flip side of uh, aspects of the left who are interested in using state power yeah. to achieve certain social objectives. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm, I'm not sympathetic to that. I mean, what we call the crisis of meaning is, a, is an old problem. Uh, in a way, it's a good problem to have. And, and I think the way to put it historically is to say, for almost all of human history, 99.9% .9 of human beings didn't have the luxury of worrying about what the meaning of their lives was. They, they, they had a very rudimentary set of answers. I need to do X, Y, and Z, <laughs> get enough food, get shelter, look after my family. And so the, the meaning issue is, is, uh, is, is sorted out for them. So I think it's an incredible luxury and a great human accomplishment that we now have 90% of the world's population in a position to say, what is the meaning of my life going to be? And I think it's to be expected that in the first several generations of trying to do that, we're not going to be very good at it. Now, part of it is all of the elements that, uh, you know, someone like Friedrich Nietzsche, and Dostoevsky were worried about in the 19th century. So uh, you know, as we become more scientific and <clears throat> naturalistic, religion undergoes a crisis. But to the extent that we'd relied on religion, lots of people are saying, okay, if I can't do religion anymore. I really find it hard to have that old fashioned faith in religion. Where am I going to find meaning? And that's going to be, you know, that's, that is going to be a big problem. Uh, and the, the one that we started to struggle with in the, after World War II, if suddenly we've got a whole bunch of teenagers who are growing up in luxury and freedom, uh, and what are they going to do with their lives? And if they become dropouts and hippies and drug addicts and so forth, well, that is a that is a problem, but is a it's a it's a luxury problem. So I think we are getting better at that. I, uh, to go back to the concept of happiness that you put out a little bit, the the data do show that overall people are happier. And they are happier in the freer countries, they're happier in the richer countries. And so I think we do have some 21st century anxieties that are a little more local, a little more specific to work out, but we are learning and we are working on them. The thing that I'm encouraged by is that yes, we do extend childhood, we do extend the teen years and so on. But uh, my sense of the literature, again, I'm not expert in here, but what I have seen I is we're also that, that most people get those things worked out by age 30. Yeah. And they do, they put together a pretty good life for themselves. So I guess one concern that people have is that if you have these wealthy societies and then you have a bunch of these kind of people who don't know what they're doing and, you know, we have the stereotype, the, I guess they talk about the oversaturation of PhDs, for example, you have all these people who are, don't really have a good sense of meaning that in the meantime, before things get sorted out, they might be a threat to the progress or kind of the liberal project so far. Right. Sure. So, you know, if we think of teenagers going through teenager issues, yeah, there is, of course, the danger you know, with the teenagers' emotional ups and downs that when they are in a down, they do something overly destructive. And so they don't get themselves right through that position. So you scale that out to other social demographics as well. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I think that's, that's why we need to uh, rethink what we are doing in education. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Yes. And, and, and rethink what a large part of what we are doing in, uh, in family life. I think yeah, going back to those two core social institutions, we do need to have, we do need to have an evolution. Now, the last year and a half, and, and right now I'm still working a lot on education issues, and I'm very encouraged by all of the experimenting and entrepreneurship that's going on in the education sector. That wasn't happening 20 years ago or, 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 or 30 years ago. But definitely, you know, getting away from this model of one size fits all uh, 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 and moving toward a more individualized approach to, to education. If we are taking seriously the idea that people can, you know, we are in a rich society and we, we aspire to being a free society. 
uh, that you can dream big dreams. Well, if we're going to do the stereotype of you know, putting students in chairs in rows and having the teacher drone on at them and the answers are all known, and you better not fail the test and you do that for 12 years. You know, that model of education has been dead for a long time and it should be. <laughs> well, I don't know if you're anything like me, but I, I hated school for the exact reason. Yeah, reality. absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I hated it from first grade through my last year of college. I just- yeah, That's right. Yeah, I think the normal healthy human being hates school. And finally, we are doing something about that. And again, it's been one of those institutions that we've been extraordinarily deferential to. We bend over backwards to give extra privileges to unions to, uh, to, to, to say, okay, we'll give you another few billion dollars and, and, and so forth. So we've thrown money, thrown problems, right? So there's a big problem there. We're aware of that right now. So you and I had our heads on the same thing twice today, one on the three biggest public intellectual parlor games. Nice. Name yeah. Second was kind of the theme of the year for 2021 for me was education and I really made an effort to do a lot of interviews with people who were trying to look at education and think about it differently. Beautiful, beautiful. Cost, whether it was Ann Kim on the AP exam and just even some of the nitty gritty of it as well as kind of the philosophy of it. But I think a lot of people, especially people I hear from who are, have kids in college and they're paying the bill and they're saying, this is nuts, at least in the United States. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There has to be an alternative to this. And I think, I guess, that fellow Brian Kaplan maybe got started a couple of years ago with the case against education. Yep. Yep. That's yep. a lot of people and a lot of people. Are Very thinking. smart guy. Yep. Good work there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah, I, I teach philosophy of education regularly and my, my next book uh, uh, is, is on exactly on that topic. So a lot of it does have to do with uh, philosophical commitments, right? People have a worldview and they want to, uh, in many cases, impose that on the kids. And in many cases, those philosophical worldviews are anti-liberal, anti-entrepreneurial, right, and, and, and so forth. So we do have a philosophical debate. We do also right now have this institutional debate. Uh, so whatever we think about public education and government schooling, we're rethinking all of those things. We do have uh, wonderful technology and lots of uh, resources to throw at the problem. So we do have all these experimental things that are going on. So I think it's actually a, a good place for us to be in. So as we get toward the end of our hour, I just want to ask you one final question mm. on education. And then I want to ask you sort of a final question that I alluded to on the whole national conservative movement that I think is pretty ascendant. But um, so do you think that, are there any key insights or key trends currently going on in how people are re-examining particularly higher education that you're mm. optimistic about? I know there are various people who are trying to start alternative schools, for example, uh, Stephen Blackwood, for example, mm. this, this University of Austin. So there's that's sort of kind of, in my mind, a little bit of a market solution. They're saying, okay, we're going to go build our own school. Yeah, yeah then, that's right. Then there are people who are trying to maybe push forward reforms within the existing paradigm. Uh, I guess last month I interviewed James Lindsay and he felt that the, the war should be in the current schools to kind of reform them from within. Are there certain things that you're seeing that are trends that you're optimistic about if one shares our mutual goal of doing education, particularly higher education better? Yeah, I think both of those and I'm optimistic about both of those. Yeah, I do think the tens of thousands of entrepreneurial experiments are going on. Even if you focus just on higher education, it's not going to be tens of thousands, but there are hundreds of initiatives going on with respect to building brand new kinds of educational or higher educational institutions. Some of them will be online, some of them will be bricks and mortar and, and, and so on. And I think some of those will be, will be uh, successful. Uh, you know, much of the history of modern education has been exactly that people starting brand new schools. Some of them right. succeed spectacularly and, uh, and, and, yeah, and some, of them, some of them fail. Schools and every other type of school. That's right. And uh, you know, despite the bureaucracy, it's never easier in history than it is now to do that and to do that well, partly because of the resources and, uh, and other kinds of freedoms that so we have. I'm also, go, go ahead. ahead. I was just gonna say also, the school I attended was, I was the second year of it existing. It was kind of an upstart entrepreneurial effort and it's still in existence, you know, decades later, which I think is, is, yeah, yeah that's right. 
Yeah, uh, yeah, and I'm on the board of a, a one called Reliant College. It's trying to get uh, its fundraising uh, together right now. It's got a nice, very strong educational mission. Maybe it will work. Maybe it will not. We will. We will see. I'm also optimistic about the reform within existing higher education. Obviously, there's a lot of areas of sickness inside higher education right now, but there are huge sectors that are very healthy and uh, they will continue to be healthy. I think a, a lot of ex uh, existing higher education institutions will go out of business over the course of the next generation. The ones that succeed in reforming themselves will, uh, will, uh, will, will continue and they will, they will be stronger. So I think that that's, also, that's also the case. But I think also, despite the perhaps higher level of disease and sickness going on in higher education right now, postmodernism and critical theory and all of its offshoots uh, uh, manifesting themselves. I think that's unique in the last uh, two centuries of uh, challenges to, to, to liberal education. I do think we will get past, uh, past this moment. Universities in part are supposed to be hothouse laboratories of weird experimentation. And uh, those experiments get tried out. They make a splash, but uh, smart people and uh, more reasonable people do prevail in the long term. I like I think Stephen, that you, you take the long view of things. Yeah, sure. Uh, so the last question I want to ask you is you've probably been following, there's this rather ascendant movement called the National Conservatives. And I know a number of these people, they write at MW, they come on my, my show, and um, they are basically suggesting openly a alternative to the sort of liberal small r republic in the united states and obviously they cite a, they cite hungary and a couple other places as mm. their example and they're gaining a lot of traction and a lot of people find their arguments persuasive in the sense that if you are from a policy perspective want certain right of center policies enacted there they would argue that you've basically lost on every issue within the liberal system for the past mm. however many decades and Part of it is tied to what we were talking about before, this sort of optimism, pessimism. Some of them argue specifically that we're in what they call the end of growth, and they look at kind of fossil fuel consumption and say that, you know, the, the current trajectory is no longer sustainable and is going to reverse anyway, and we need to prepare mm -hmm. for it. And this movement is really kind of gaining steam, and they'll be having a conference in, in Brussels very soon. What do you say to that worldview? Right. Well, I'm not. I'm not sympathetic at, at all to this national conservatism as you as you're describing. I have some some awareness of it. Right. I'm not. I'm not a conservative. I'm not a nationalist. And so the the combination of those two, uh, philosophically and in terms of critical principle, I think it's a, a wrong way to go. I do think they are overly pessimistic about the the liberal project. In many cases, they package. Uh, the, 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 you know, the, the non-liberal progressivism under the label of liberalism. So there are some interesting issues there. At the same time, I think what I would say is uh, the person you want to interview, if you want to go down this road, or someone I would recommend would be uh, Professor Bradley Thompson at Clemson University. I make a note. I know I've read. I'm really interested in, in this question. And yeah, more I know, about I've read a few things by him. And there's other people who, who have read, but he's the one who jumps to mind right now. As someone who would uh, who, who has done a study of them, and would be articulate in giving a steel man version of what they are about, but also a good uh, rejoinder. Right. So, Stephen, really good to see you. I'm so glad we got to follow up on some of the things. Yeah, about pleasure. The last conversation was good. This one was really good. Let's do it again sometime. Absolutely, and maybe then we'll have we can continue to th see how things on, uh, progress. And I think maybe the education issue should be our focus next time. So. Ah, okay. I would love that. This has been great, Stephen. Great to see you. All right, Eric. Take Bye care for now.